Yo! What's up, everyone? Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Patrick. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Well, no Patrick. Hey, everyone. It's Melissa. It's Melissa. By, by Patrick, of course, I mean Melissa. <laughs> okay. Uh, Old I can, dog, I can try to trick. do Patrick today. <laughs> I, I nice have one. no funds near me, though. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's all right. Kevin, Kevin's in the chat, um, so he will keep track of any it depends uh, that may happen. So welcome, welcome. Um, Hello, everyone. So, uh, oh, go ahead, Matthew. No, no, you, you, okay. you go. I'll bring my It Depends joke <laughs> right. in later on. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. So many people. It's, it seems like it's been forever. Um, so it's great to uh, see the chat very lively. It's been Matthew uh, had the chat going very strong um, even before the countdown. So uh, that is great to see. Uh, Patrick is not here, uh, so he has some family events, um, but Matthew and Melissa are both here, so I am appreciative of that. Uh, if you are new uh, to the live stream or Gynecube in general, put hashtag new in the chat. We always love seeing the new faces around here. Uh, also, uh, if you uh, see folks with the green name or the uh, um, the icon next to their name, those are members of Guy in a Cube. And so just big shout out to them. They help us do what we do here on the channel. So thank you very much for being here. Um, of note, we will not be doing a member only chat this stream. So we'll keep it open the whole time so we can keep the discussion going focused on, we are going to prioritize questions on Power BI adoption, implementation, governance, those types of things. Uh, so be aware of that. So if we don't get to your question, I'm sorry, come back next week and we'll try it again. Uh, so, but we do want to uh, focus on those items uh, because of Matthew and Melissa being here. So excellent. All right, real quick, let's see uh, see what the, the new folks we have here. And then I will introduce uh, Matthew and Melissa. Uh, so I see Scott is new. Welcome. And also Scott's a member. Thank you so much for being a member. Um, Oluwa for me is new. Sorry, I pronounced that horribly. Uh, Jay Clark is new. Robert is new. Anita is new. Uh, lots of mature folks. Um, I see that. Uh, Matthias is definitely not new. Uh, good morning, Candice. Great to see you. Uh, Rodami is new and also a member. Thank you so much. Uh, Clodoldo Costa da Silva is new. Welcome. Uh, Christian, <laughs> yeah, not new, not new, buddy. Uh, was good to meet you at Bits, though. Appreciate that. Um, let's see, any others I'm missing? Ron is new. Welcome. And that's, I think, everything there. And then uh, Stina in Texas, member for 21 months. Uh, looking forward to today's topic. I am too. It's going to be amazing. All right. Uh, so with that, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you to uh, uh, all the new folks that are here as well. It's amazing. And uh, Josh Ludeman in the house. I see you, buddy. Thank you for coming. Um, all right. Let me introduce our guest today. So Melissa Coates is an MVP uh, with the Microsoft uh, Data and AI community. Uh, been focused, uh, I've, I've known Melissa for a long time, going back into SQL oh. Server and BI and all those wonderful things. So Melissa, I don't know if you wanna just say a few words about what you're up to and, and, and what your interest is. Sure, sure. Well, yo, thanks for having <laughs> us and uh, this will be fun today. Yeah. Um, I'm Melissa Coates. I'm located here in North Carolina on the east coast of the US, at least for now. The family has plans to move to Portugal in a few months, so that's pretty exciting. That's exciting. But for the moment, before we really get into high gear with uh, moving internationally, uh, I focus my time mostly on a couple of different things. In the Power BI world, my niche really is adoption, governance, administration type of topics. So I have a data warehousing background. I have the technical background, but right now my uh, the things I find most exciting are how do we do this well? And so uh, we're gonna give you some resources today if you're not familiar with them, but I have the very good fortune of being able to work with Matthew and writing some documentation like the Power BI Adoption Roadmap and like Power BI Implementation Planning that we will elaborate on a bit later. Amazing. Yep, that is your your passion, and I will say your superpower uh, it, within the within the Power <laughs> BI community, and we very much appreciate it. So thank you for being here. 
Um, and Matthew, thank you so much for being here again. So folks in the chat, I'm sure you're very familiar with Matthew. He keeps order and discipline uh, where it is needed, uh, along with Chatmaster C. Um, so Matthew, do you want to just say a few words? Yeah, absolutely. For for this audience, if if your intersection with me is the the Saturday live streams, you're probably thinking of me as the person that is increasingly intolerant as the hour <laughs> goes on, as people don't put Q in front of their questions. But for my day job, uh, like I, similar to Melissa, like I've I've been doing IT for decades. You know, I've been working on data, BI, ETL, data warehousing, like uh, data governance etc. This is where I've spent the last 25 plus years. For the last five years, I have been a co-worker of Adam and Patrick working on the Power BI customer advisory team. And for a little bit of context, I will say like Adam and his team. So this includes all of the generalists that are uh, like the standard Power BI CAT team members. Like they are the tip of the spear. Uh, they can talk to anyone from an executive to a developer to an analyst on any topic uh, in Power BI or reasonably adjacent to Power BI. They figure out where the problem is. They propose solutions. They get the right people in to get the job done. If you end up with Adam or Patrick or another member of their team like like joining your team, odds are something has gone horribly wrong because uh, they're the only ones that can solve your problem. My team and I we take a more proactive approach. So uh, my team runs a program that we call uh, Power BI Enterprise Voice, where we engage proactively with the biggest customers in the world uh, to understand what are their goals, uh, what are their priorities, uh, how they're using Power BI and other data tools today, uh, and where do they struggle today. And the reason that this is important for this call is over literally hundreds and hundreds of these conversations. Like we've had uh, almost 800 one hour executive interview type engagements uh, over the past five years. What we heard was that the single biggest challenge for these large companies, it's not, it's not a feature, it's not technology, it's not any of the technical stuff. Their biggest challenge most regularly is how do we actually get more value from our investments. So uh, like, how do we build a center of excellence? How do we make sure that our adoption uh, is following best practices? How do we build a data culture so that more people are doing more of the right things with more of the right data at more of the right times? And this is why I have the joy of working with Melissa. So between what we on the CAT team learn from our customer engagements, between what we've all learned in our decades of working in IT uh, and between Melissa's amazing instructional design and, and technical content development uh, excellence, we're basically able to produce guidance like the Power BI adoption roadmap uh, that uh, Adam has already dropped the link to into chat. Uh, and we're actively working today uh, with MVPs Peter Myers and Kurt Bueller uh, to uh, flesh out and complete the Power BI implementation planning guidance, which is basically once you know the direction that you're going in because you read the roadmap, now how do we actually bring the right pieces together in the right ways uh, to figure out what our solution is going to look like? And then we've got the amazing Power BI like feature docs, those core documentation uh, that the product team produces that we can point to for specific features and details. So that's what we're like that's where we're coming from and my personal goal for today since all of these topics are squishy right like none of these topics are like oh do this one specific thing because when people get in the mix it's always complicated it's never easy my goal for today is to not say it depends once my goal for today is anytime that we would say it depends to instead discuss and share insights into the factors that it depends on. So no money, no dollar bills today. Over to you, Ed. <laughs> oh, that makes Kevin sad. <laughs> oh, see, Kevin, you're going to have a break today. Nothing needed. Or a Ex breakdown today. Or a breakdown. Yes. <laughs> Marco. <laughs> Marco said it depends all the time. <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, all right. Um, 
Excellent. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, it is always a pleasure to, to work with you in the day job and also to have you uh, involved on the Gaina Cube side as well. Um, so it is, uh, it, is, it is a pleasure on that front. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a big topic um, that uh, from the cat team side, even on the generalist side with what Patrick and I do, like this is always this always comes up. This is always the conversation, right? And I've already seen a bunch of the questions already in the queue. Um, a lot of good things, and, and people people want to know, um, and so that's why you're here. All right. With that, let's get to the rules. Matthew likes rules. Um, so rule number one: put Q colon in front of your question to get them queued up. Chatmaster C is standing by. Um, one time is all you need. Uh, if you do spam the chat, you will get put into a timeout by either Chatmaster C or one of our lovely moderators. Also not Patrick today because he's not here, uh, but it's never Patrick. Um, it could be Matthew, though. So just be aware. He's got his swords on standby. Um, so do not spam your chat. Or do not, no. <laughs> don't spam the chat and don't spam your question. One time's all you need. It gets into the queue. We'll get to as many questions as we can. We never get through all of them. Um, so if we don't get to your question, apologies, come back next time. Um, there will not be a member only chat today again. Um, so just, we're going to leave it open the whole time. So members, uh, feel free to put in your questions as well. Um, Chatmaster C is going to help me, uh, keep track of, of those items. Um, so, uh, we will do our best. All right. Anything else? I think we've, we've covered everything. Um, are Melissa and Matthew, are you ready for the questions? Yes, sir. All right. Let's do it. Also, uh, Matthew and Melissa, real quick, if you do see a question that moves you and resonates and you want to jump to that question, you have the power to jump that question to the top of the queue. Um, so so you, you have that ability. So, so for example, the question that Alex uh, dropped in a minute or two ago that I said, I love his question, something uh -oh. like that? Uh, yeah, except I don't see it. Was no, it's because he didn't prefix it with a Q. Oh, uh, well. But it was still an awesome we, question. It was so, Alex. If you want to uh, resubmit with a Q colon in front of it and and follow rule number one, um, perhaps we will uh, address that question. Um, Enforcing the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and and I love that. That's the first example. Uh, that is amazing. So your question's not in the queue because you didn't put a Q colon in front of it. Um, all right. Uh, also, uh, if you do want to jump the queue, super chats will always take priority. Um, so we will we will honor that on the stream as well. Um, okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and I didn't. Uh, so so I see multiple Alexes. Also, is it the Alex uh, Maru that's at uh, Alex? Alex Alex Maru. I'm, yeah. I, I assume okay. I'm horribly mangling right, his last name, but that is the one. All right. And I see he did get his question in. So we will start with that one uh, because he did follow rule number one uh, on the second try. So, so let's do it. Um, all right. Question is, how do I make a bulletproof argument for self-service? That is a good and question. I'd love to take a first stab at this, but I also want to make room for Melissa. Do you want to jump in or do you want me to lead, <laughs> Melissa? Go for it. Okay, so the short answer is you don't. Nothing is bulletproof. Like, like that's number one. There is no silver bullet to any of these questions. Uh, but the the easy argument, like the easy way to approach uh, self-service business intelligence from a governed perspective is emphasizing the appropriate usage with visibility and oversight being part of the process. Uh, the reality is that uh, like business finds a way, like kind of like in the original uh, Jurassic Park movie where Jeff Goldblum says life finds a way and it turned into a meme. Uh, every user that needs data to do their job is going to get access to that data. It's probably just going to be like an Excel export or a CSV that they copied from somewhere else. They're going to work outside of the system. And there's going to be no visibility. So having... Uh, the right people engaged, which is going to depend on your organization and the data that you're talking about and like what the scope of the data is. But basically to start with who should have access to what data or what's the process for getting access to it. And assuming that we're looking at this through a Power BI lens, uh, if there is a data set 
that has already uh, been deployed to a workspace in the Power BI service, you can use the data hub to set up both uh, discovery so that users who don't have permission to access the data yet, that they can find out that the data exists, they can evaluate its metadata and request access through the channels that the owners of that data have set up. Basically, instead of saying no, you're changing the default answer to be yes and so can i have access to this data yes and here are the prerequisites uh can i use this data yes and this is the steps or these are the steps that you need to go through so there's never a bulletproof argument but if you understand the business value that more self-service in a given domain will deliver and can articulate that to the people that you need to convince you know, people that you need to make this argument to, it tends to be relatively straightforward uh, once you can demonstrate uh, that you understand the risks and are taking that into consideration. And if I can add on to that while asking you to show slide 13, Matthew, oh, this is my ah. favorite slide. I always have to find some excuse to bring it into a conversation. But the reason that I want to visit it briefly is because I want to say that these different ways we can employ BI, different ways we can use Power BI can absolutely coexist. So the same team might be doing business-led self-service BI, the thing that you want to try to encourage based on your question. And that might make absolute sense for certain teams that are totally capable of doing decentralized self-service BI start to end on their own. There's absolutely use cases for enterprise BI and that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's not wrong. And then there's this middle that we tend to call managed self-service BI where maybe there's a partnership and maybe, uh, Matthew mentioned the data hub, right? Maybe a centralized team has produced the data and the decentralized teams are more agile and working on the reports that might change the analysis side much more frequently. So I like to say that all three can coexist within not only the same organization, but even within the same department or business unit, just depending on what you need to accomplish for that particular thing. Amazing. Love it. I love it. All right. And I dropped a link into a chat. So this is a topic that comes up a lot. I have a blog post on it on my personal blog from a couple of years ago. So there's a link in the chat. Uh, it's a bit long, even longer than my verbal answer, but hopefully it will give you ideas. You'll be able to run with it. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, so Rishi's got a question. Uh, skill set is still one of the core barriers to adoption. I see. What are the best training resources you can roll out across a large organization, including the people who aren't as passionate about it as us? Yeah. Who wants to start? <laughs> well, I'm happy. I'm happy to go, briefly. but it's going to be the <laughs> Matthew show. <laughs> <otherwise>. <laughs> which is totally okay. I just have a couple uh, of ideas to, to share and then we can go to the Matthew yeah. show. <laughs> Training is a tough one. I don't want to encourage you to say, oh, we got to develop an enormous amount of in-house training. That's not usually worth the time and effort unless there's very specific things like how you handle data for this particular data source, for instance, right? There are certain things that make sense for, but your centralized portal that has frequently asked questions, that has some links to things you've validated online that are trustworthy, right? Things like that, that you've curated for your people based on what they're trying to accomplish is where I would start with that sort of thing, rather than saying, oh, this training, right? Of course, SQL BI has great training. There's a bunch of different uh, types of offerings there. I have one too, but that's, uh, to me, that's not the point. It's more about how do we get people information the fastest so they can be productive? And is that a link to a blog? Is that a link to an existing YouTube video? Or is it custom training? Yep. And I'll, I'll add before Matthew jumps in. Um, so one of the things uh, one of the things I've seen a lot is organizations tend to have like a central SharePoint site or some 
some place that they've done what Melissa said, they've curated the content. Sometimes it's like, here's the beginner entry, here's intermediate, here's advanced topics to help them help guide them uh, through those items. But I'll also say some of it is is understand your audience within your business as well. And so what works for company A may not be the same path that works well for company B. And so you have to talk to your users and under, find out the questions that they're asking you that resonate a lot. And those are kind of your starter points for what do I need to get out there to get ahead of this, right? So how do I deflect those questions so that I can focus on maybe the more important things and, and help them self-discover and self-educate? All right, Matthew. Yeah, absolutely. Abs absolutely love it. And I love a lot of the comments that are coming in in chat as well. So like mm -hmm. there's a lot of wisdom coming in uh, from the participants on the stream. Uh, I'll mention that the Power BI adoption roadmap includes uh, articles on both uh, mentoring and user enablement and establishing a community of practice. And the thing that I like the, the big point that I want to mention that that came up obliquely, but I want to say it out loud you need to meet your users where they are uh like data is king pointed out like uh like passion is mandatory it's like it, it better not be um so passion is something that is missing from 90 not, well, from 90 percent of the people that are going to be working with any tool like they've got a job to do they they're, they're showing up to get a paycheck and if you need a given person to use a tool or data or follow a process, you really need to lower the bar to make it as easy for them to do the things that you need them to do so that it's making their life better rather than giving them extra steps to follow or extra things that they need to do. Um, and then from a tactical perspective, <laughs> In these customer interviews that I mentioned up front, the thing that I've heard from literally scores and scores of these customers, like probably over a hundred different customer organizations, they talk about having that SharePoint list or SharePoint site of curated content where there's three things that are included. Uh, the first one is links to the appropriate product documentation. Like here's a link to the feature or the list of connectors or whatever it is. Uh, the second one, uh, and I'm, I just realized I'm holding up numbers that I can see on my camera, but aren't, aren't included like two, the second one. <laughs> um, so the second one is uh, like the internal documentation for their processes. So this is how you get a license in our organization. This is how you request a new uh, data source to be added to a gateway in our organization. Like that's something that you need to create and make accessible to every user that needs to do those things. And then the third thing is the list of Guy in a Cube videos that are most relevant to the types of work that they want their users to be doing. And it really, like, it really surprised me when I heard these huge organizations talking about like a third party community resource. But the exciting thing is if your users don't have passion, like if they're not really gung ho going out, I'm going to read all the blogs and watch all the videos, having a source that brings their own passion like Adam and Patrick do for the topics that they cover in their videos, this is a great way to reach those people that need to do the work uh, to help them uh, get started and find a little passion of their own. Love it. Um with that also uh i will i'm going to jump over to my machine real quick and actually show mm -hmm. some technology here so so if you've gone through the things that melissa and matthew have talked about with you know maybe getting some of these central locations for uh education and whatnot and or instructions on like how to do licensing how to do all these things one thing that can help and you should talk to the admins of power bi about um if if this exists in your organization and they haven't done this uh, something you can point to, let me go to my machine. Um, there is actually a tenant admin setting where you can go and add links to these items. Um, so they, uh, you know, these can help. So you can override the links that are in Power BI with relevant documentation that's internal to your organization to help people discover it. Because sometimes the problem is they're inside of Power BI, they don't know where to go. And so they'll just hit the links, the default links in Power BI and go out to Microsoft documentation or or whatnot, and then they never discover your internal content. So this is a way uh, that you can help elevate your internal content uh, within your organization. So, all right. 
Cool. I, I want to mention a comment from, from DAF as well, okay. uh, who says, my adoption success almost always involves making someone's day a little easier. Oh, that like I love nailed that. it, yes. nailed it, right? Yes. So if, if, if you can make it so that the thing that you really want or need them to do is the thing that they want to do, like you've won, like yes. that's, that's the tactical Absolutely. victory that you can build on and replicate. Love Those it. kind of things always make my day. Um, and there was a, one of the TV shows I used to watch, there was a quote in there where they talked about like the struggles they had and everyone tries to make it a lot better. And we go after the big things like, just, just make it a little better, right? Just, just take that initial step and, and just help someone. And yeah. So it doesn't have to be this big grandiose plan because usually in your organization, you're not going to find quick success with that anyway. So, all right, excellent. Let's go to, uh, go back to, all right, uh, Matthias, which was actually the first question in the queue. Uh, from earlier, we're going to jump to that one. Uh, so how can I monitor quickly uh, which content Power BI apps a guest user has access to? We were actually chatting about this one before we, we started. So Melissa, uh, I know that we, we, we talked about this. I'm going to start with you on this because uh, we'd already kind of cried a little bit. Um, uh, I can but, grumble a little yeah, bit for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Power BI apps and not to be confused with Power Apps or anything else, the Power BI app where we take a set of reports and dashboards in a workspace, we bundle them up and produce them as an app to give our consumers a nicer way to view the set of content, right? So that's what we're talking about here. And the ability to use audiences within a single app just went GA eh, sometime in the last couple-ish weeks, very recently. And what we're still waiting for from Microsoft is an API. So there is an API to get users from your apps, but the audiences feature is so new that the API results don't yet show, oh, if I have three audiences, right? Maybe my sales reps and my sales managers and something else. Uh, and so we've mixed and matched a little bit. Uh, that's coming out now so far in the activity log, but only if you edited the actual audience. So if you have three audiences and you only edited the third one, the activity log is only going to show the third one. So don't be fooled into thinking that that's a good snapshot. It's not. So right now there's not a great way programmatically to get that data. And while I'm on the topic, if you are starting to think about how do I figure out what a user has access to when you're looking at the APIs, you're going to need to take a look at several different things because there's the per item sharing, there's the workspaces, there's the apps, right? So you're going to have to plan to grab different APIs and put this uh, together in, uh, in order to do a full analysis. And I'm hoping the, the progression of the scanner APIs will help bring those items together um, Hopefully, yeah. And then help also yeah. elevate those things in purview and, and other sources. So it's a journey. Absolutely. So, and, and I'll also add, like, keep giving your feedback on these items too. If that's important to you, go to ideas.powerbi.com and make sure that it either exists and or you vote up what's already there. Um, being very serious yeah. and about And there that. is an idea. I don't have the link off the top of my head uh, or at my fingertips, but there is an idea already posted for give us the audiences as part of the app results from the yep. API that is. Yep. Yeah. And and this this is the key thing like the this isn't available via the API today. The product team that owns this feature area knows that it's a gap like it's on the backlog. Your votes and feedback through ideas.powerbi.com is one of the ways that you can directly influence the priority that they put in. There's always a trade-off because if you choose to do one thing, you are also choosing to not do something else. Your votes and feedback through ideas.powerbi.com, especially with the scenario of here's, here's the goal that I'm working to achieve. Uh, this is what I can't do today. This is why it's important, like that context uh, goes a huge way. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's go. Uh, 
All right, I'll, I'll throw Heidi's question out there. Uh, and uh, Matthew did respond in the chat earlier, but I, I will put this out there because uh, Heidi is a wonderful person. Um, any chance of a Melissa Matthew pre-con, post-con workshop in a day in the APAC region, so Asia Pacific region? Um, I know virtual is a different experience or a virtual day. Can you flip over to show my desktop uh, while we're responding? Yes. Oops, not that. So uh, the that context. There we go. Yay. So the go. context behind this, uh, behind Heidi's question, is uh, Melissa and I uh, have a one day, full day uh, pre conference session that we've done once at the uh, the past Data Community Summit last November in Seattle, uh, we had like upwards of 130 participants, uh, either in person or remotely. Uh, we are currently working on three different upcoming sessions. I'm going to share the details for the next one first, uh, because on Friday, May 5th, uh, we're going to be running this pre-con, which is basically what we believe are the most important topics uh, around Power BI adoption from the adoption roadmap uh, with our guided tour, uh, lots of time for Q&A, lots of interactivity. Uh, we're going to be the Friday before the uh, SQL Saturday in New York City. Uh, in June, we're going to be coming to Data Cayley in Dublin. Uh, and then in September, I'm going to be like flying solo without Melissa uh, for the Power BI Next Step conference in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, like the information is on my blog and on Melissa's website. But for uh, the most important thing is that uh, it's out there. It's a way to build on the content that we've made freely available and turn it into more of this type of interactive conversation. And for Heidi, and maybe this is when you switch back uh, uh, away from my desktop, Adam, but for Heidi, uh, like we love the idea of coming down to Australia or New Zealand or somewhere else in the APAC region. Uh, if there is an event organizer uh, that is interested in this, we'd be eager to have that conversation, just need to make the logistics work. Adam can't come unless he brings Crystal. Yeah. That's Cr the most Crystal, important Crystal tool. is a requirement, or Chatmaster C is a requirement uh, for any trip to Australia or New Zealand for me. So, which is which is a fair, very fair rule, so. Uh, he has to say that though, because she's right there. <laughs> Otherwise, otherwise, Adam gets put into a timeout. Um, so, all right. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's her number one bucket list. Um, all right. Uh, excellent. So I'm excited for those. I also now uh, very hungry for New York pizza, which is my favorite pizza. Um, are you, I, are we going to see you in New York? Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've actually got a lot of travel coming up and it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, so I have to. I have to be uh, a little. Uh, I'm, my my goal is, or my yeah, my my goal or my rule is, I'm trying to do just one thing a month at the most, um, so mm -hmm. as to not impact family things and other items. And I'm just, I'm potentially going to two things in May already. So um, yeah, and it's not the it's All not good. it's not the New York uh, SQL Saturday. I have been to that one before, um, and it's amazing. And I always love going to New York, but not this time. All right, uh, Mr. Uh, Chris Wagner has a question. Ooh. What core principle philosophy is best for companies to strike a balance between creating a free-for-all and a draconian lockdown environment? Melissa, do you want to? <laughs> it looks like Melissa has something to say. I know. She's... <laughs> oh, sorry. So here's the thing, and I didn't believe this for a really long time. But having some level of chaos, some level of a free fall is a good thing, just not too much of it, right? So sometimes I hear people say something like, oh, let a new user do whatever they want for six months, right? And, and, and that's the kind of thing that I think is a little too much. But I think that helping the newer people 
let them just get in there and figure it out for that first two to four weeks with support if they ask for it, right? But then help them with better ways, right? Help them make sure in their first 60 days they know all about what a shared data set is. They know when they should use one and when they shouldn't, right? And that will help you avoid technical debt way down the road. So I don't wanna stifle people being creative and getting things done because not every solution needs to be, you know, enterprise level. But I want them to know, for instance, I talked to somebody at a client once, they'd been doing Power BI for a year. They didn't know that they shouldn't just create a new data set, every single report file or PBIX file that they create. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that we can prevent. So I think that a little bit of a curated experience, but giving them a little room to run at the beginning to just not too much. Do you want to share my screen again, yep. Adam? Let's do it. So, so the, the philosophy, like the, the quote that I dropped into chat was discipline at the core and flexibility at the edge. Uh, this is a, a phrase that Microsoft has adopted as part of its journey towards managed self-service BI. Like keeping in mind, Microsoft is a huge company, so there's lots of pockets of everything. But, but if we're thinking about the, the balance between a chaotic free-for-all and a disciplinary and like data authoritarian regime, uh, it's not one or the other. It's gonna be, where do we uh, need this authoritarian approach? What do we need to have locked down? Because it's, it's, uh, uh, there are privacy implications, there are compliance implications. Like, like this is data that if it got out, it would like negatively impact our business. Uh, like for that, you want the tighter controls, but there's probably gonna be a much smaller volume of data sources or systems or applications where, the, uh, where these tight controls make sense. Uh, but at the same time, there's going to be like most of the data, you want looser controls and very often the, uh, the, the decision that would go into it, like the, the factors that go into where are we uh, looser and where are we tighter are like less oversight, more oversight. It has to do with both the nature of the data and the scope at which that data is being shared and used. Um, and uh, and like I want to I want to highlight uh, Chris Jones just dropped a comment in like is there any question that Matthew doesn't have a slide for? These are Melissa's slides. Like like Matthew is all about uh, answering verbally, and Melissa is all about being really prepared <laughs> with an effective graphical summary already there. So kudos to Melissa, uh, and she she cherry picked a small set of slides from our precon. Uh, so this is the type of information that you get if you're able to join us in New York or Dublin or join me in Copenhagen. Nice. I, I will also add that oh, Melissa. Oh. oh, go ahead. <laughs> so there's one more thing. Like, and I'm, I'm picturing a different slide that we don't have ready to share. But I also want to mention, uh, going back to Chris Wagner, uh, there there's nothing wrong with chaos. There's nothing wrong with authoritarianism, like in this context. Um, if it makes sense and aligns with the organization's goals. Uh, the thing that we found on the CAT team is that this managed self-service BI approach is the best in most contexts, but there are some really large global organizations with tens of thousands of Power BI users that they just keep throwing premium capacities. Like, yep, do what you want. If we run out of room on this P3, we're just gonna get another one. Uh, because for them, this cost benefit calculus makes sense. The value that they're getting from the data-driven decisions and the bottom-up organic self-service, it aligns with what they need today. And they know that at some point in the future, they're gonna have a giant mess to clean up. And there are other organizations that we've seen that have standardized on Power BI as their business intelligence platform but they don't allow any self-service at all, or like this is a couple of years ago, they do now, uh, but they basically had tens of thousands of users, but they had tens of pro licenses, right? They had a, like a, a locked down process where all of their Power BI content was coming from a central data team in IT. And both of those examples are outliers, but both of them are successful, vibrant data cultures running on Power BI. You find the thing that works for you and realize there is no one size fits all. 
Love it. Love it. Um, I don't even remember what I was going to say before you continued on, so it doesn't matter. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. It's it's great. Um, okay. Uh, so Melissa uh, has indicated in the chat that she wants to elevate uh, uh, Lauren's question and then John's question. Um, so let's go with Lauren's question next. Um, could you discuss how organizations can use the Power BI Adoption Roadmap to prioritize which data projects should be tackled sooner rather than later? Oh, I love that. That was a good question. Do you want me to go to slide yes. 11, Melissa? Yes, please. Okay. You're ready for you, Adam. There we go. Awesome. Here. So every one of these topics concludes with what we call the maturity levels. And there are five levels. Now, the big thing to know is that as they are written, they are not gonna work perfectly for you. They are pretty short and admittedly pretty generic. The whole idea is not for you to take them verbatim. The idea is for you to take them and say, oh, I have ideas. We think we're at about a 200 for content delivery scope. For instance, we need to be at a 400. And so the thing that I like to suggest to people to do is, a, just kind of get familiar with it end to end, and then figure out where are your biggest pain points or areas of risk that you have to prioritize and your biggest opportunities. And so for instance, system oversight is number 10, and it's not on the roadmap as number 10 because it's the last thing that you do. Same thing with governance being six. It's more about if you're getting acquainted with all of these topics, those things need information about your data culture. They need your decisions about how content ownership and management is going to work so that you can make good governance and system insight decisions. So if you think about it from that perspective, then once you know that, yeah, there are certainly some dependencies, you don't have to do anything in order per se, but you can A, figure out what your top areas of risk or top opportunities are, and then decide, okay, this quarter, we want to really focus on building out our center of excellence, for instance, and we want to jump a full level this quarter. What will that take? Damn. And I just want to say out loud, uh, what Melissa has just said here is part of uh, the adoption roadmap for our guidance on, uh, on how to use it and to get the most value from it. Uh, and since since my screen is still being shared, uh, I just want to show off like one of the other suggestions for use. Uh, and uh, unlike most successful 12-step programs, uh, this one does not begin with admitting that you have a problem that's kind of like step zero uh, in this roadmap or in this process. But we, we definitely want to make it as easy as possible for everyone out there because uh, as uh, PA Beater, Pa Beater mentioned, it's like, well, what about the the maturity level that's like zero or less than 100? Like, <laughs> that's where most organizations are. We want to help you understand where you are today and where you might choose to go so that you can like, like take the next steps to get from where you are on that journey, understanding that it is a journey, uh, not a specific destination. I love it. Uh, everybody starts at the beginning, right? So you, you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. And I see a comment in the chat about how it's personally very hard to get the executive sponsor first. So Matthew, how important is your executive sponsor? Uh, a little, I guess. A little bit. <laughs> um, so, so like this, this this could turn into a long answer, so I'm going to rely on Melissa and Adam to keep me honest, <laughs> or at least to shut me up if I if I run with this too far. But having an executive sponsor is probably the single most significant factor to the success for organizational change, which includes building a data culture uh, and like driving adoption of a tool like Power BI. Like it's really really important. It is possible to drive change from the bottom up, uh, like organic pockets of change that are driven by direct user action. Uh, but the scope of this 
tends to be like limited both in size because a, a given individual contributor can only influence where they work and it also is limited in duration it's temporarily limited because at some point you get tired of banging your head against that brick wall over and over this is where having an executive sponsor that believes in the positive change that adopting a tool like power bi or building a data culture will bring and to drive this type of change, keeping in mind, most people like you don't get to talk to the CEO, right? Like Satya doesn't answer my calls. Um, apparently I'm not uh, allowed to call him anymore. He doesn't answer your calls? Uh, that's that's interesting. Uh, no, I can't. But <laughs> you have an idea, like if you're asking this question, if this is a thing that is important for you and is within your reach, you have an idea for what the business goals your executives care about uh are or where they fit into right uh so think about uh the term digital transformation like it's kind of like a hand wavy marketing phrase like big data was and large language models seems to be now but executives both ceos cios cdos like all of the chief data centric or chief executive chief executive officers, they understand to one degree or another, the value that comes from having data driven decisions and optimization, rather than having organic tribal knowledge and people making decisions based on their gut feels or personal experience. And if you have insight into the specific types of business change that are important for a leader in your organization, that's the hook. So demonstrating through whatever channels are available to you today to those leaders that that there are solutions for the problems that they care about this is the like this is the hook this is that first step and the final thing that i want to mention before i shut up in this topic one of my like like power bi heroes is this guy tim who works for a large company in London. And Tim used to be a finance analyst, right? Like he's literally the finance guy. He copied, he pasted, he lives in Excel, but he fell in love with Power BI and other parts of the Power Platform and Microsoft 365. So he's not just a data guy, he's a solving problems guy and saw that data was a part of it. And what he saw was a large part of his job was preparing data to go into Excel, to go into PowerPoint, to be printed out, to be used in executive meetings in a boardroom. Like, like he was spending tens of hours per week on this and other people on his team were as well. And he's like, I am done with this. Like this is ruining my quality of life. I wanna change something. And he found organic ways to just happen to be where the CFO was, like in the elevator, in the break room, in the conference room, like his, cause his work intersected with the CFO. Uh, and he would just happen to have on his iPad, a Power BI report with data that was relevant to the CFO. It's like, hey, have you seen this? Flip, flip, flip. And the CFO is like, oh my goodness, like where, what's this thing? How do like, I get more? How come you have this awesome thing and I'm stuck with these printouts of Excel workbooks, right? <laughs> so. Like this may not be a replicable pattern, but executive sponsors really, really important. Trying to do significant organizational change without an executive sponsor is like running a marathon in sand. Is running a marathon is hard. Doing it in sand is stupid hard. It just makes everything harder than it needs to be. And yes, how to stalk your how sponsor. How to stalk your sponsor. Exactly <laughs> correct. And, uh, and how do you funny. know? How do you know that you have a real executive sponsor? They will be independently active uh, about the things that you're doing. Like when they're getting data from a, a report or a Power BI solution that you've delivered, they will go out of their way to say, I'm making this decision because of this report. They will point people to the report for the information. If somebody brings them data that's coming from a source that's not the right source, they will say, we're not going to review this until you bring the numbers from this trusted source. So, uh, and and for, uh, for, for Jay who asked, do I have the Tim story written down somewhere? Uh, I don't because it's not my story to put in writing. Uh, I might anonymize it even more at some point, but I don't believe I have yet. And Daph yes. said, uh, e eating, eating cake, cake is better than describing it. 
Very true. Uh, for all my gamer friends out there, the cake is a lie. So. Ooh, and and Rishi. So Rishi just mentioned this. Uh, Lauren Faber from oh, my team. Oh, yeah. uh, she did a session talking about Tim's story. Like she got Tim's uh, approval for this. So look on YouTube on the Sequel Bits channel uh, for Lauren talking about customer something something. So yeah. the minute you said Tim, someone I knew exactly who's a moderator who can find that. I, I, I knew exactly who you were talking about. So I love Tim. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Uh, clock is a ticking. We're getting close uh, to the end. Uh, so Melissa also called out uh, John's uh, question as well. I will add that John, Patrick, and I shared a moment on the M4 together uh, in the UK uh, with a flat tire. Um, and we did push the limits of a run flat tire. Um, so we, we made it. Um, it was great. Uh, but yeah, Patrick just said, let's roll. Okay. All right. So John's got, uh, do you have best practices uh, in, instituting meeting discipline with decision making and the use of certified data sets over other reports presented in executive level meetings? Ooh. Meeting discipline. Uh oh. Hard Sorry. though, right? And so here's the thing. We love to see reports branded with, you know, either it's produced by this person or this team, or it's certified, or uh, it's validated, right? Something branding on the visual level that shows that executive, I can trust what I'm seeing because I know where it came from. The question, though, is about certified data sets, and that's the thing underneath the report. And that's where it gets so much trickier about how do we make sure that any report that is certified is also using certified data and or isn't accidentally showing the wrong branding if the data source changed or another one got added and that sort of thing. So I don't know that I have a great answer, but it's a fascinating and a wonderful question. And in my experience at Microsoft, this type of change where the executive leader of a significant meeting like quarterly business business review or whatever they need to understand the value of working with a single set of numbers so that they can enforce that discipline from the top down this is one of those things where like when i joined microsoft 15 years ago literally every large group meeting the first 45 minutes or so of a quarterly business review would be it's like these numbers don't look right like where is this coming from like all of that nonsense where people are butting heads and and you can never make real decisions because like oh well i think we're going to do this but we need to get down to the bottom of those numbers uh like i literally can't remember the last time that's happened but it really comes down to the the value of making the change being obvious to the people with the levers that uh, that can control the change. It's a, it's a tough one. I will also add yeah. if if you can have a Matthew in your meeting that will help move things along, um, you're good to go. Um, he is amazing at that. So I often Truth. don't feel Especially like I with move your meetings execs along. And your sponsors, if you don't <laughs> run your meetings well and you don't make sure that they're using everyone's time really effectively, mm -hmm. right? And a, and a clear agenda, preferably available ahead of time, exactly what we expect to cover, exactly what we expect to get out of it, all that kind of stuff. They are gonna stop showing up. They are gonna stop caring because they're always gonna be triple booked. So you gotta make it worth their time for sure. Yep. So again, not an easy answer, but <laughs> an important thing to do. Yes. Excellent. All right. Also, I forgot to mention uh, there were two super chats that came in. So uh, Chris Wagner came in and said, thank you, Matthew and Melissa. So appreciate that. Um, and also uh, Bob uh, Kundrat came in with a super chat as well. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. Um, okay. Uh, yes, the world needs more Matthews and Melissa's. Uh, so let's go. So Jay Murphy had an interesting question. This is This comes up every once in a while that I hear, and I would love... Uh, both of your thoughts, Matthew and Melissa. Um, so Jay Murphy said, what's the current focus on supporting and enabling nonprofit organizations in the adoption of Power BI tools and platforms? So from a nonprofit perspective, like how do they go about it? And is it different? 
All right, so I'm 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 going to answer because I see Melissa is thinking. We'll give her a little bit of a uh, little bit of room here, um, and I'm like my superpower is being able to answer and not knowing what's going to come out of my mouth, but I can yeah. still talk and sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's amazing. But but in 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 my experience, like there's there's no significant difference between a nonprofit or a for profit organization, uh, except for in the resources that they have available to them to do the work. So one aspect of this, uh, at which I'm not able to speak about in any depth, it's like comes down to licensing. So from a licensing perspective, uh, if I understand correctly, Microsoft has specific licensing that's available for nonprofits, like talk to your account team, uh, use your favorite search engine to figure that one out. But then beyond that, for nonprofits, in my experience, like not, I'm not an expert here, but in my experience, there tends to be a small number of core people that wear a lot of hats. Like these are the, the full-time employees. They're, they're really into it. They're doing it because they want to make a difference in the world. Uh, and then there is a larger number of people who are, uh, uh, working part-time who are volunteering, who are like less available, less engaged, uh, and, and they because of their patterns of engagement being less consistent their ability to build and and act on their own individual maturity is greater uh sorry is lesser is reduced <laughs> um so so if i if i think about the adoption patterns for nonprofits all of the guidelines that are in the adoption roadmap in my mind they all make sense uh all of the maturity levels they still apply the biggest difference is going to be what are the things that are most important to you today to act on given the different constraints that are outside of the Power BI space? And if I were like if I were thinking out loud about this, I would expect that for like for the first period, like the first couple months or the first couple years, being really organic and responsive and like just working with data so that you can minimize risks to inform your plans, like to increase the confidence that you're going in the right direction, like do those things, like, like work like a startup, work like a small team, uh, and don't worry about doing the right thing all the time. And then when you see either a diminishing return on the value that you're getting from that investment, or you start to see obvious places where you're spending more time than you want to because of the constraints of being a nonprofit in general or being a specific nonprofit, that's when you look at the maturity levels in the adoption roadmap to see what would I need to do to go from where I are, where I am now to a more mature, uh, effective operating position for this given area and keep repeating like using the little windy road example from the slide yeah and just to add on to that you absolutely don't have to and you can't you shouldn't try to shoot for a level 500 in every aspect it's not realistic and it's it's just not going to be possible so focus on what you can do. So that nonprofit, for instance, maybe you've got one person wearing a lot of hats and maybe a lot of the data sets and reports are very much produced by one or two people and most everybody else are consumers, for instance, right? As an example of that, that means a lot of the mentoring and user enablement activities, if you don't have hundreds or thousands of self-service authors out there, right? Scale all that back, right? And focus on here's what really matters to us because we all have constraints and certainly a nonprofit might have more. Um, it's just a, a harder, more uh, uh, difficult problem if a lot of that is staffing and money and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, and Adam, yep. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Yep. You'll let us know when we need to wrap things up. I want to, to when we're done with questions, I wanna share an analogy like as a final closing okay. thought. You let me know when. So it's I'm going to do. I'm going to do one more question um, that I think is important, and then we'll and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and so, Stina in Texas, and, and by the way, there were a ton of questions in the queue, so I really apologize. There are a lot of good questions. We didn't get to all of them. Maybe we'll have to do this again to to go through more on this topic. Um, but Stina in Texas, we were talking about SQL Saturday, um, and she asked SQL Saturday, "If I'm new to SQL, is it too advanced?" No. No. No, absolutely not. There's, there's varying 
levels of different topics from also from professional to technical. Um, and I would add that like if we look at a SQL Saturday or a local user group or um, you know, even bigger conferences, one of the biggest goals or biggest things that I get out of those events too is the networking aspect to making connections. Um, yes, there is absolute learning that you will get, but um, but but being able to to meet people and and make those connections is super important. And to say yes in a slightly different way than what Adam just said, uh, or like to, to encourage you, um, sitting in technical sessions that are way over your head, where you're like I have no idea what these people are talking about. If it's a good presenter, it's valuable to be in that room today because six months from now, you're going to like run into a problem or somebody's gonna share information that is accessible to you. And you're gonna be, aha, yep. I saw this person talk yep. about this thing and I didn't understand it then, but now I can bring it together. Like yes. that's where the magic happens. So, so if there's an event that fits your schedule, that's local or accessible to you, like really leaning into the community, this is an incredible accelerator for any career of any stage, whether you're a participant starting to network or when you realize in a few months or a few years that you have a story to share or information to share that will be valuable more broadly. Like this is, it made the biggest difference in my career years ago. Can't encourage it enough. Yep. Any other thoughts, Melissa, on SQL Saturdays? Uh, not at all. I think they're wonderful. I um, I enjoy them so much. And you know, if you are love to talk to people, you can do the networking hallway track. And if yep. you're a little bit like I'm not shy per se, right? But I'm not somebody that is out of my way talking to everyone. So I'm a little bit more introverted in that way. So I tend to attend more sessions and there's usually uh, multiple sessions going on at the same time. How many depends on the size of the event, but yeah, there's almost always a uh, beginner level or uh, introductory level type of topics, more so than those deep dive advanced yeah. topics usually. And the last thing I'll mention is just that they're often a great ground to getting started speaking, whether it's you or others. So it's very uh, less pressure yeah. in that sort of way. And, and that's always really fun too. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll also add, uh, you know, we're saying SQL Saturday a lot. Don't get caught up on that term either. There's a, even now like the, there's different events that are similar with different names. So you'll see data Saturday, SQL Saturday, I used to, I went to, in the pre-COVID, I went to a SharePoint Saturday. So there's a lot of different events that are like that. So find out what's in your area and uh, attend what you can. Um, and the SQL Saturdays are typically free events. They may charge a little bit for lunch, but, um, you know, that's that's typically something you can attend. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, we, are, we are over time. So Matthew and Melissa, any final words of wisdom? So Melissa's going to go first because I have an analogy that I want to share to wrap things up. It's going to take me two minutes. Okay. Oh, two minutes to prep uh, or two minutes I do minutes not have total. any prepared final words, so go for it, Matthew. Just thanks, everybody, for a fun conversation. This was great. And, yep, yeah, appreciate having you so, here, Melissa. So back in the day, like 2012, oh. I looked in the mirror and said, who is this fat old man looking back at me? I knew that I needed to get into shape. I swear I'm going somewhere data with this. I knew that I needed to get into shape and I had no idea what to do. And I found uh, a free, like today it's behind a paywall. So if you ask me for a link, it's, you have to pay for it. But I found a free bodybuilding course from this guy named Lee Labrada, who's like the Mr. Rogers of bodybuilding. And it was a 12 week program where every day there was a little video of Lee talking. It's like, oh, today you probably feel like this and, and we're gonna do these things. And here's like these fit young people going through today's exercises. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I had the voice of an expert meeting me where I was saying, do these things today, understand it's part of a journey. Do these things today. This is probably what you feel like. Like we're making a little bit of progress. We're gonna get there. And at the end of this 12 week program, I felt better. I had muscles, I had energy, and I had learned skills that I could apply and build on it and go in a whole bunch of different directions. Because even though I didn't know what I was doing, I had the voice of an expert in my ear telling me what my next step needed to be. 
And if you think about the Power BI adoption roadmap and the implementation planning guidance, this is what we're trying to do. The things that we're discussing today, these are hard. There is no right answer. It depends on all of the things that are unique to you in your organization. But if you go to the adoption roadmap, this is what works. Like we've learned from hundreds of giant organizations and smaller organizations, these are the things that you need to do to get to these common destinations. So go there, take advantage of these free resources that we've published. Use this as your voice of the expert because it's a journey that you need to take, but you don't need to do it all on your own. That's what I got. I love it. And, uh, and just let, because you have the slide up, I'll just put it up one last time. Uh, if you're going to be in the New York area, uh, check out the New York SQL Saturday coming up on Friday, May 5th for the pre-con and then May 6th for the main event. So that'll, uh, you can get to meet, uh, Melissa and Matthew in person and it'll be amazing. So, and in June we'll be in Dublin, June in Dublin. So if you're not in the U S but you are in Europe, uh, We'll be in Dublin in June and then Matthew Copenhagen in September. Yes. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matthew and Melissa. Always love having you on the stream. Uh, just amazing content and, and knowledge. And again, lots of questions in the queue that we didn't get to. So uh, come back, everyone, next time. Uh, we'll, we'll answer more questions and, and we'll look on as a follow up for Melissa and Matthew. This is obviously a very hot topic. So uh, we will continue the conversation. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a Thanks, great everybody. rest of your day. So there we were beneath the burning sky. Both had a reason to live, but so much more to die. Who we'll fate decide? Who we'll has to go? Oh, oh. We both know pain, but we deal it too. Or who's dealt more? Well, I leave that up.